think sometimes we get disappointed and we get discouraged through this one little word called comparisons. And I think sometimes, I got some notes here on my phone too, I think sometimes we compare ourselves too much to others. So when I start to compare myself to others, guess what happens? I don't enjoy my race. Right? When I start comparing, well, I don't have Gucci. All I got is what my mom bought me from Thompson store in the village, but it looked good. I don't have this. I don't have Jordans, but I do have a little Air Force One. Back in the day, I used to have Travel Fox or Everlast that never lasts from Royce. You guys remember that? From where? You had a shoes called Kung Fu? No, man, I never heard that one before. That must have only your daddy bought that. But sit down, Jamal. I get, I, I get a little distracted. Bruce Lee shoes, the kids. No, I don't remember that. No, I don't remember that one there. That before my time. That before Jesus was a boy. Long ago. So what I, what I learned is that comparisons really kills your joy. What about in relationships when you see everybody going out for dinner and, 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 and stuff like that and on an account go for dinner? Or what about when somebody has a smile and you wish you can take a selfie with your husband or your wife like that and they're always happy and all that? One of the things you learn is that not everything, not everything is as it seems. Because sometimes people don't, well, many times in a very virtual world, they never post the the progress to get to that smile or they never post what they're really working on because who is interested in the truth nobody right so we want to make we want to make believe life and so we live in for the likes sometimes i do it i can't tell you no lie sometimes i put a post up i can't, I can't wait to see who like that i mean that just nature i mean we live in that world where you know 10 years ago that was nothing 10 years ago we could leave our phone if we left it home for half a day, no problem. Now we can't even leave our phone to the bathroom. And I raise my hand up here. Because we need to even be entertained when we're on the throne. So it's just, and why are we doing this? It's because we are so caught up in other people's lives. And sometimes, many times I would say, that's a fairy tale. What if we were to focus on our life? Don't you think we would get a lot of things done if we were focusing on our relationships instead of wondering, let me see who out there. I, I got exercise buddy named Shanti. I like him. He's a good, you know, cool guy on the internet, controversial. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a trainer. He's married to a guy. That should give you the controversy in his life. But he's an awesome guy. Awesome fella. And what I'm learning is that it's entertaining to look at other people's lives. It's actually entertaining to look into somebody else's life. But what is challenging is to take stock of your own and figure out that you got to put in the work too. And so I want to talk about that today. I want to kind of talk about that. Ecclesiastes verse 9, 11. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, and, and, and I want you talked about, when I'm talking about Ecclesiastes, this is the same guy who wrote Proverbs. This is the same guy who wrote Songs of Solomon. And this is Solomon, King Solomon himself, known as the wisest man. He had kings and queens coming to him to even get court with him, to just have a quick session with him. And Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not for the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. What is this saying? You know, I want to be the number one person in the classroom. I want to be the best executive. I, that's my desire. Like, please don't, don't, don't disregard what I'm saying about excellence, you know. I'm not saying don't be excellent. I'm not saying don't progress. I'm not, not saying don't learn. But your excellent, you know, needs to be appreciated. 
Your unique gifting needs to be appreciated, needs to be embraced. Where you are at, you need to fully understand that there's purpose in the midst of that. He says, the race is not for the swift. How many of us want to get there so quick? I mean, I love real estate. I'm on EK every day. And um, I know prices and cost of living is high. And, and you know, I appreciate everyone who's a homeowner here and doing investments and stuff like that. But when I talk to younger people who is the age of like 23 to like 30, who doesn't own a property, who are professionals, who make some aspects of finances, they still haven't made a decision to purchase anything. And their assumption is in their dream home. Or know what they like. And I'm saying to them, you're in a position at the starting line of life. You need to get your feet into the game. You need to get your foot wet. You need to buy something that you can build on because if you're waiting for that dream home, it's not going to come. And that's just one example of a home. If you're waiting on a dream family, it's not going to come. You need to appreciate the family that you currently have and work with that and watch God bless what you're willing to work with. So he says, enough for, the, enough for the swift. He said, the battle not for the strong. I know plenty strong people that lose battles. Many times we're fighting unnecessary ones. You see, the, 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 the distraction of the enemy is to have you fighting over here while you're not paying attention to what's happening over here. We fight in what we can see. Physically, not understanding that behind the scenes, the battle is over here. We, 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 we fighting, quote unquote, our boss, we're not understanding there's a battle over here. We're fighting our spouse, we're not understanding there's a battle. We're fighting our children, and all of a sudden, we get so distracted in all these battles, we're tired when God is saying, it's not about your spouse, it's about you operating in grace. It's not about your boss, it's about you being teachable. You see what I'm saying? It's about you understanding that at any given day, you're going to have to work with the day that you got. And so God is trying to teach us something, but if we're looking for perfect opportunities or perfect moments, we lose this race. It's enough for the strong. So sometimes we're tired because we're battling too much things. You know, somebody asked me the other day, text me, Pastor Felix, how do you stay hopeful? I said, well, I know what I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for Dorothy and the kiddos and Journey and, and my job. I am not the governor. Thank God I took a selfie with him today. That was awesome. Pretty good. The man is super fit. Love that. I am not Mr. Wayne Panton. I am not a head of the border control. I am not head of the police. What I can do about crime is to make sure young people understand their value and begin to participate in the community well. Or I can see someone going in a wrong direction, man or woman, no matter what age, and have a conversation with them. But my responsibility to curb crime, wh 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 how is that? I am sorry that so and so is going through that tough time, but guess what? I, I still have to focus on what is mine. So I want to encourage you that sometimes we, we fight the wrong battles and we have too much things juggling the air and we, we got to drop them down because if we stretch ourselves so thin, we're not going to be able to enjoy Nothing. Even God rested to enjoy what he created. God was not tired. Even God rested. Now rest looked different. Like me, rest looked like going for a run. I know that sounds foolish, but I feel good when I do that. So others might be a, a long series watching on the couch. For some, it might be ironing, like my brethren in the back there that love to iron. I don't know who. You are, brother, but pray for me because I don't like to iron. In fact, I buy clothes that don't have to iron that much. That's how much I don't like ironing. But you feel relaxed. You give him three or four bundles of, that's it. Don't bother him. He good. So we all different. And it says, no riches for the men of understanding. Some of us think people are just rich because they're wise. That's part of it. But to be honest with you, what, the, what, Paul, what, what Solomon is trying to tell us is that we have to make most of the season that we're in. I was listening to an interview and they were asking this young black 
entrepreneur, and I say black not to define who he is, but you know, sometimes people look down on certain people, and I just want to let you know that the man, the man is a very favorite. If I said his name, you would, you were like, whoa, that he said. He said, do you believe in luck? He said, I believe in some aspect of it, but here's what I believe. He said, he believed in showing up on time. And he wasn't talking about the clock, even though that's some part of it. He said he believes of being aware of the, the situation and your purpose and the season that you're in. And once you're aware of it, you show up with expectation of what you're pursuing. So if I want to be better at wealth management, then I have to steward what I currently have as, as, a, as a person. I want to be better in relationships. I can't be thinking about the, the grass is green on the next side. I got water where I'm planted. If I want to be a good father, I have to try to think about well, what does a good father look like? Because if I try to father my kids like they're seven, I'm not going to be a good father to them. So what season does I, do I need to require? You know what I'm saying? So I just want to encourage you that many times we experience breakthroughs simply by being aware of what season we are in. So it's not for the swift, it's for those who endure to the end. Let's read Corinthians now. Corinthians 9 verse 24 says this. And the reason I got inspired, like I said, I'm watching all these runners. Some of them, if I were them, I, listen, all of them beat me today. You know why? They enter the race. Every single one, even if they're still on the road right now, they beat me. Because they enter the race. Well, he says it's not for the quick and not for the swift. It is for those who endure to the end. Now Paul give us some insight deeper than that now. He says this, isn't it obvious that all runners on a racetrack keep on, verse 9, 24, keep on running to win, but only one receives the victor's prize? Check this out. He is saying that in a race, now, now he's talking about a race like Olympic race, like 200 meter, like 100 meter. And they're also talking about marathon because marathon is well, happening around that time, right? And so... What he's actually saying is that nobody gets into a race to lose. Now check this out. There's only one true winner of today's race. But look how much people run it. There's a winner in the, in the marathon for the 26 run miles. There's a winner for the half marathon. There's team winners for the, for the individual relays or team relays. They're all winners in different categories. But guess what? Only one person run the prize. And he says run in such a way to win the prize. Now, if you know only one person could get the prize, then why run? And Paul wasn't talking about the reward you physically get individually, but there's a reward of participation. There's a, a reward of saying yes to something and working it through. There's a reward of being disciplined. There's a reward of exposing yourself to do something that you know that is tough and possibly cannot be accomplished. But because of the training, because of the focus, all of a sudden you are pushing a mountain. And maybe the mountain didn't move, but boulders move. A couple, mon couple, uh, couple months ago, I tried to do push-ups. I couldn't do five. I just using physical ex as an example. Yesterday for fun, because I was discouraged, and I was working till eight, no, Friday till 8.30 with this ATM, Leticia. Me and the security guard. You know, we frustrated. We, we don't want to be here. Work done from 4.30, 5 o'clock. So me and him now do a push-up challenge. I got to look back on the camera and say, <laughs> but we just said, give me five seconds and we do a push-up. He did 20, I did 20. I couldn't do five. The reason I'm saying this is because, again, comparisons. Comparisons, if I compare myself to where people are at in their fitness or their journey of life, I will never start mine. We need to start ours. So it says, listen, yet each one of you must run the race to be victorious. What Paul is trying to say is that we have to have purpose in our living. What's the purpose? Because you might get discouraged because you're a janitor, for example, or environmental manager or whatever. Let's use the lowest thing that people talk about, garbage man. But one thing you don't know is those garbage men make like $14 an hour. $12 an hour, $10 an hour, and $14 or $15 an hour if you are a driver. The construction man on average make about $14 or $13 an hour. Uh, 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 $13 an hour. If you own your own trades, man, these guys be making big projects, big this. So sometimes the very thing that we look down on is making great money for somebody else. Because you look good making your money, 
You despise them looking dirty, making their money. But in the end of the day, their bank account is shh. Look how much times we, we would despise, for example, the Jamaican helper that would be here helping us. We had like three growing up. Jamaican helper come and help you. You don't pay them too much. I don't know how much they pay them, but let's just say an average of $1,000 a month. Now she got to pay her rent if she's not living with you. Now that leaves her with at least $500 a month. Now six years, seven years down the line, you go to Jamaica and you see what she built. And you never heard her complaining. And, and, and you never gave her a bonus. You just treat her as best as any worker could possibly be treated. And I'm saying to you, she could have complained. He could have complained. He could have got frustrated. But he had a goal. So he ran the race as if he was going to win the prize. Do you have purpose in what you're doing? Do you wake up with purpose? Because if we do wake up with purpose, if we don't set our hearts to accomplish anything, we do not achieve anything. And so this is what he says. A true athlete will be disciplined in every respect. How does an athlete get disciplined? Well, the first time you got to think about is your diet. What you eat is very important. <laughs> and so if you go into strict training and you have a goal, you're going to have to adjust. That's what he's saying. How can we achieve certain things or want certain things without wanting to be adjusting or be flexible? How can we achieve a home if we never save for the down payment? How can we achieve healthy friendships if we don't steward at least one relationship well? How do we want successful marriages if we don't even want to be married? Or we have this dream of what we... Listen, I, I don't know, but you have to work with the favor that God gives you. What about the dream job? Okay, you want to be the boss, but you're complaining that you got coming at 8.15. Or maybe you got 12 sick days and you use the 10 sick days as vacation. When people are looking to promote you, they're not, they're not looking at, they're not looking at how skilled you are. Many times they're looking, are you dependable? Because the Bible says he's looking to and through throughout the earth to see who he can make his name strong through. And many times he's making his, strong, his name strong through the Bible through simple people. He says, not many of you were wise until Jesus Christ came. Not many of you were this until Jesus Christ came. You know, you just became available and God used you. The foolish thing is to believe that you the only one can do who you do, do what you do. I taught that when I had my sabbatical from God. I thought I was the only one that could reach the young people that came on islands. Oh, I was prideful, aren't I? You know, like. But God raised up other people. Because God's purpose has to be achieved. What is God trying to achieve through you that you're not allowing him to work in you with? God is trying to achieve something in you and with you and for you that you can't even understand fully why he got you in this season. I can't understand fully why he got me in this season. And when I'm telling you, journey with your season. Embrace your season. Because God is trying to teach you something. And as you learn what he's trying to teach you, your season shifts. He's such a good father, you, you think that he wants you to keep stuck, but he's saying, Felix, you not learned that yet. Come talk to me about that. Felix, you not doing that. Look at that now. You upset about this again. Felix, bam. And I'm saying, God, when this going to shift? He said, when you shift, things shift. When you sing a new song, your season shift. What song are you singing over your life? I'm more busier, quote unquote, than I used to be because I'm working at the bank now. But what season am I shift? Am I say, I'm saying, God, you're providing for me. God, you're blessing me. God, you're giving me an opportunity to humble myself because now I got to sit under somebody's instruction over me, whether I agree or not. And I got to work with a team who's at different levels. And guess what that is doing? That is stretching me. It is challenging me. And I'm saying, God, set me free. And God said, no, because time is not finished yet. There's still a purpose with that young person that you work with you. There's still a purpose in that department that you're working right now. There's still a purpose. And all of a sudden, when I be think about my purpose, I go to work hopeful. That doesn't mean I always write. It just means I go hopeful. And what is hope? Hope is positively expecting God's goodness in your life. Are we expecting God's goodness in our life? Are we expecting the enemy to show up in our life? I'm expecting God's goodness in my life. 
I'm expecting good conversation. I'm expecting God's favor. I'm expecting that when a problem comes, I'm going to have a solution for it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but God, you brought me so close to this issue. There must be a reason why I'm, I, I, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made for this. So we run in such a way, we discipline. Constant self-control. Galatians 5 talked about self-control, right? In order to win a laurel reef, talking about the reef back in the day, which quickly withers. We are so, we, let's talk about our physical rewards. We will be driven by physical rewards so quickly. If I told some of these young people right now, I got $100 for you, let's do this. Woo, I see somebody, eyebrow just come out right away. And I can't blame them because I am like that too. I get reward, I, this is motivation. God knows that and God says sometimes your reward, you're going to have to wait for it. That's the tough part. Oh, it's tough because we live in a microwave society and we see people that it worked. They had this work, that family, that business, that, that, and it worked. God, why it not work for me? God say, you know what? Maybe they're running for a reward that is simply tangible. But I have a reward for you that is going to continue from generation to generation. God economics is different from our economics. You know that the poor man Lazarus died and was in Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was in the, the enemy's camp. I'm telling you, God economics is different. The woman that gave her last penny gave more than the rich people that were given the offer. God economics is different. And if God eco economics is different, then be open to the difference. He says, but when you run, run our race to win a victor's crown that will last forever. That reef is going to disappear. That promotion might disappear. I'm not saying I'm saying pursue it. I'm saying what's the purpose? Pursue purpose. Say, God, I am available to do what you call me to do. That will last forever. A good name, the Bible says, is better than silver or gold. That means when I left the conversation, people are still talking about me. I tell people all the time, every opportunity I've had is because I've stewarded the previous opportunity. So what are you stewarding now that's going to open up the door for you in the future? Because the Bible says the hand, heart of the king, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. So that means one day, one day, that situation, that person over you or alongside of you economically at work is going to shift in your favor. One day. And if it don't shift with them, they're going to shift with somebody out of them and you just exit well. Because you always want to have a bridge. You never want to burn that bridge and say, peace, I'm out of here. Because you never know who walks through your door. You never know who needs to stamp your passport at immigration. You never know who needs to grant that phone call for you at the bank. You never know. So leave a good name wherever you go. May your name be a sweet aroma that when they pick up the phone, they say, Letitia, I'll help you with this. No problem. I know family members that because of my name, they get through. And vice versa in certain areas. You know, sometimes they say, well, I, I went to school with your mommy. Okay. Help a brother out. That, and it happens like that. Or I know your wife or so and so. It happens. A good name. So I'm encouraging you to run for something that is eternal. He says, for that reason, I don't run just for exercise. Or box like one throwing, right? Or box like one throwing to the wind. Or throwing aimlessly punches. So <laughs> what Paul is saying I'm going to give you a shadow boxing. I'm going to exercise, but I have purpose with my exercise. You know what I'm saying? And when I shadow, when I box in, I'm not boxing invisible things. I make sure that I am very intentional of where I strike. I'm very intentional where my words go. I'm very intentional where my time go. I am focused in this area. I am not running aimlessly. Are we running aimlessly? Are we spending time and energy on things and people that are not giving us any reciprocal return in relationship? Because the season I am at as a person right now, I am looking for that reciprocation. I am looking for that brother or sister. I am looking for that friendship that will just say, hey, iron sharpen iron. Listen, you dull today, Felix. It's okay because where you're weak, through God we can be strong. How does Paul know he's weak? I said this last week. Paul knew he was weak because he was vulnerable with people. 
That means he had relationship that can see. Were you weak? So people could call him up higher and say, yo, big man, my brother, let's do this. Do not forget your purpose. Do not forget your calling. Do not forget your yes. Remember those punches. Remember those strategic decisions. Remember the focus. Remember the drive. Remember the testimony. Remember who you are. Simba. Sometimes you got to be like that. But I train like a champion athlete. Oh, he's not champion yet, but he trained like a champion. You're not a boss yet, but you, but you train like a boss. You're not married yet, but you, you conduct yourself with honor as a woman like you're married. You, you're not married yet, but you conduct yourself as a husband. You know, you're not a lead pastor yet, but you're faithful to the few. You, you know, you not, you not have a, a stepchild or a mother or a father, but you, 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 you act in such a way poised for responsibility. But I train like a champion athlete. I subdue my body. Sometimes your body don't do, do want to do what your purpose has called you to do. Your body doesn't always say, yeah, we're going to do this today. Faith without works is dead. And sometimes you've got to awaken yourself to come alive in that area where you feel dead in. Where you feel discouraging. And he says, I have to subdue my body and get it under my control. You know that you can control your body. You know that you can speak to your body. You know that you can bind that area of your body and loose that area to be loose in your body. You know that you can speak over your heart to be healed where there's trauma and drama. You know you can speak to your mind, subdue your body. And Paul is saying, because I have focus, because I have purpose, when my body doesn't want to accomplish what God has called me to do, I got to speak to my body. Body, you have to run this purpose for, this, for, my, for my family. Body, you got to run this purpose for my job. Body, yes, I might be the first one to have this aspect in my body, to get healed from diabetes in my body. But body, you're going to have to be healed from diabetes. Body, you're going to have to be healed from childhood drama. Body, you're going to have to be this, you're going to have to. Body, I speak to you and you're going to subdue my purpose because I'm not agree agreeing with the surface. I'm going to speak to my body, and I'm going to say, body, you are able. Now, you know, you might not be able to run, but you can walk. And if you can't walk, you can squat. You can do something, and that's what I'm trying to get you. Stop thinking about all this grand thing. Do the little things well and watch God open up big opportunities. He says, I subdue my body and get it under my control so that after preaching the good news to others, I myself won't be disqualified. Why do we need discipline in our lives? Because God doesn't want us to work so hard and be disqualified. Paul is saying, I go preach around the world. I speak to this. I speak to that. And many times I'm doing it by faith. And many times my body is counterintuitive to what I want to pursue. But guess what? I preach to them and I preach to myself and I subdue it so I don't get disqualified. Look how much time you see a runner, just as past Olympics, disqualified. False start. Twice. Over to the next lane. Maybe take some, 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 some treatments that was not lawful within the, the FIAA jurisdiction. All that stuff you take in account. What, they work so hard to make a bad decision to disqualify them. And that's what Paul is saying. I work too hard. I got too much invested in this, my son, my brothers, my church, Corinthian church. Don't run. Don't disqualify yourself at the very edge when your father and mother work so hard for you. Don't disqualify yourself where you said you want to accomplish this. Remember who you are. Simba. Now, uh, you might be saying with Felix, why are you saying Simba? Jamal, let me tell you why I'm saying Simba. Have you watched The Lion King? You remember that part when he was trying to confuse, he didn't know who he was, and he was running away from his purpose, and blah, blah, blah. And remember when, what what the little monkey guy name? I can't remember his name. Huh? Rafiki. Rafiki was like a prophet, a prophet you know, in that whole Lion King. And where was the prophet? Seeking the Lord, literally, he was trying to wait for the right time to speak to the next king. And he gets an opportunity. He sees Mufasa in him. And he reminds Simba, who is running from taking over responsibility in the pride line. And he's confused. And now he did a lion with warthogs. That don't make sense. 
And if, you, if you're a lion and you're hanging around with the wrong crowd, then guess what? You're going to adapt the mentality of the wrong crowd. So Jamal, guess what happened? He has this moment and he has this rev- revelation, this reflection, and he asks his Rafiki. Rafiki say, I know your father. And it speaks to identity because who our father is determines who we're going to be. I'm not talking about biological here. I'm talking about our Heavenly Father. We're going to accomplish more things knowing that we have a Heavenly Father to support us. And so Rafiki speaks to the kid inside of this king. And says, I know your father. And he says, you'd be surprised, but your father lives in you. What happens after that, guys? He runs towards the crisis. He runs towards the issue. He runs toward all, all these different things. Even though he could die. Even though they're plotting against him. He said, this is my land. This is my territory. And when he goes to it, it is vanished. It is famished. It, it, it doesn't have no harvest. It doesn't look sweet. It doesn't look good like how his father showed him what it could have been. He said, son, don't go over to the darkness. Because on that dark side, that's where my territory ends. And he goes back and he sees darkness has spread over his land. And he fights his uncle and he wins the throne again. And over time you see the harvest comes back. Because when a king gets in his rightful place, he can sow the right seeds. He can steward the tough places in his season. And sooner or later with hard work, with anointing people, with appointing people, all of a sudden Nala, his wife, is there. All of a sudden he have another Simba. All of a sudden his mom is there to help him. All these generations coming together because they're honoring who God had put in the seat to bless. Don't be a warthog when God called you to be a lion. And this is what he tells Timothy. He's talking to Timothy now in, in verse 4 of Timothy chapter 1, verse, um, Timothy chapter, Timothy 1 verse, um, chapter 4, verse 6 to 10. Sorry about that. Remixing that one there. You've been raised, the Bible says, two last verses. You've been raised on the message of faith and have followed sound teaching. Now pass on this counsel to the followers of Jesus, that you will be a good servant of Jesus. This is the message translation. It says, stay clear of silly stories and get that, that dressed up as religion. Many times we, we listen to silly stories that dress up itself as religion. Got a, little bit, got a little bit of light. The Bible says, do not be confused. Even the devil himself parade as an angel of light. One of the things of the devil, one of the things of the devil is that he has to make you believe that this is actually good for you. Like some people when they deal with bitterness and anger and unforgiveness i've never met including myself a person who is bitter or anger that didn't have a reason you're not bitter or angry for no reason something happened falling out or this and that but something happened but the thing is sometimes we validate that so the enemy does something where he parades himself in our mind and our hearts like an angel of light, giving us permission to validate that light, to validate that negative purpose, to validate that we're not going to overcome that shame, to validate all these issues when God said, no, I come to sh- move out that shadow, to shed some light on it, so that I can climb over that thought in your mind and release the truth. Jesus Christ tells his disciples one day, he says, he says, you limit me by the traditions of man. What is the tradition of man? Religion. God is not limited to work in your life. Your thoughts and my thoughts limit God. What if we agree with God's thoughts for us? In Psalms it says that God has more thoughts for us than the sun on every seashore. You know what I mean? If you ever depress you got to think about the one thing that God may be thinking about you about. God has at least 8 billion thoughts for you that are good. Pick one. And so I'm telling you right now, it's like, yo, the angel of light comes, discourages us, agrees with us, or makes us agree with him that this thing that is wrong for us is actually good. He says, now pass this on. He says, exercise daily in God. Are we exercising daily in God? Now, we know that physical exercise is good. I can't wait to go walking or running later. It does endorphins. It makes me feel good. I'm losing some weight, at least sometimes. The way I eat on weekends, I I put it back on. So I got to work hard again for the next week. But exercise daily in God. And he says, no spiritual flabbiness, please. No spiritual flabbiness. Do do, Do it daily. Find something about God. And ask him to help you in that area daily. You don't have to pray too long, but 
acknowledge him daily. He says, workouts in a gymnasium are useful. We see it. I follow enough exercise people. They're useful. But a disciplined life in God is far more so. Making you fit both today and forever. The way God wants you to be fit is for today and, and forever. If I was a young, people right, a young person right now, I would try to find who I'm going to run with for the next five years so I can grow and be fit together. Because I don't have it all together. And I need to have people in my life that are going to help me stay fit. Mentally fit, spiritually fit, physically fit. I got to be fit for my purpose. That's what God is saying here. Another thing says, Hebrews 10 says, do you remember those days right after the light shined in your hearts? Do you remember you got saved? We're talking about that on Wednesday. You endured a great marathon season of suffering and hardships, yet you stood your ground. He's saying, when you just get saved, how many of us just got saved and got a big challenge right away? When you just got saved, my first challenge was my mother being sick. Plenty of challenges come after that. But I just get saved. And he says, no matter how tough it was, you stood your ground. When you just get saved, it's so fresh, you stand your ground. You and God could do anything. And he says, and at times, you were publicly and shamefully mistreated, being persecuted for your faith. He's talking to the Hebrews now. He says, then at the other times, you stood side by side with those who preached the message of hope. He says, you sympathized with those in prison, and when all your belongings were confiscated, you accepted the vi that violation with joy. Convinced that you possess a treasure growing in heaven that could never be taken from you. When we're going through tough things, when we're going through persecution, when we're going through rejection, when we're going through shame, you have to ask yourself, God, what are you doing in me? And what are you doing for me? And you're invested in heaven for me. Wait, 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 where's, where is it? Because something is going to shift in the earth because I'm going through this trial. Something is going to shift soon. And so they're saying, when we go through trials and tribulations, Dream says, count it all a joy. I'm not saying be happy that you're going through a tough season. Trust me, I don't want a tough season. Trust me, no, I'm not coming out of this church saying, give me a tough season, Lord. I'm saying that when tough times come, I have to ask myself, what's the purpose? So, let's do it. And it says, you need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will. And then you receive the promise in full. Now, many of us have seen this meme on Facebook and Instagram. You have a miner, mining the ground, mining the ground, where he pickaxe, mining. And on the next side, one little more hit. The diamonds or the gold or whatever he's been pursuing is on that side. But he might have given up. God is saying endurance is the key to receiving your reward. Endurance is is the key because when you endure, when you be persistent, when you build that spiritual momentum, when you engage your faith, he says, as you continue to live for the Lord and live out your salvation in front of me, pursue the best that you can, have your discipline, all kinds of different things we talked about earlier. He says, God's will will be revealed. It takes a little while for God's will to be revealed. Moses didn't know for 40 years that the will was still a part of his life, that he would be a deliverer. Mary didn't know God's will. Joseph didn't know. Joseph was the stepfather of Jesus. I don't hear about the signing me up for that. Joseph was, was about, the Bible says, to divorce her privately. Because literally, when you engage back in those days, it's as if you're married, you know. You would actually leave your, the betrothed, you would actually leave your lady and go and build a house for her for about six or seven months. When that house is finished, you would actually bring her home and they would have feasting in a celebration. You guys would be married during that time. So Joseph meets Mary, says, I love you. I'm committed to you. Mary says, I'm committed to you. Seven months later, she got belly. Don't tell me, G don't tell me God pregnant you. Don't give me that foolishness. I wasn't born yesterday. I know Trevor wanted you a long time. Don't talk no foolishness on me. But guess what happened now? God gave Joseph a dream. See, God would spiritually speak to you in order to give you peace that passes all understanding. So when he spoke to him, an angel spoke to Joseph in a dream, he was at peace, stepped out of time. And we know that him and Mary had other children because we know James is the brother of Jesus. And we know his brother didn't believe in him when he was living on the earth. His brother believed on him after. There are people that's going to believe on you after. You got to be okay with it. After. Doubting Thomas says, unless I touch his side, unless I put my finger in his side, I'm not going to believe. But Peter saw, James saw, Lady Magdalene saw, every one of them saw. But I not saw him yet. I haven't seen him yet. And I'm telling you that there's a, there's a season coming 
where people are going to believe you, but you're frustrated because they don't believe you now. So he says, you need strength. You're going to take time. It says this, for soon and very soon, the one who is appearing will come without delay. And he also says, my righteous ones will live by faith. How should we live, guys? By faith. Faith takes you to, you know, faith, you have to tell your brain, logically, this don't make sense. On paper, this doesn't make sense. We're not compatible. It's not a right season to do this, blah, blah, blah. But something called faith on the inside of you says, do it. Something says, go put your resume in. Something says, go apply for your whatever, permanent residence, this status. Something says, go and go to the doctor and check this out. Something says, text that person. Something says, go to sit down on a coffee shelf. Living by faith. And all of a sudden, guess what happened? At the beginning, the scripture says, but the time. Everything comes by chance at times. So when we live by faith, we are aware of our season, and when the opportune time came or comes, we're ready. So when God is going to bless you and pour out blessings that only nobody can even, that, the, that you can't even contain, many times he's going to do that when you've adjusted, when you've given permission, and you say, God, if today the day for you to show up in that area of my life, show up. If today the day for you to show up in my children, show up. If today the day to show up in my church, if today the day to show up in my, my boss, whatever you're going to do, Lord, show up because I am ready. What was David saying in the fields that appointed him as king? What was the woman who was getting married to what, Abraham, Isaac, what was the lady who was going to get married to Isaac was thinking about when she watered those camels? All of them she watered. What was she saying in her tent and saying, maybe I want to get out of my father's house. I don't know how to do it honorably. And the next day, a man comes on a camel and says, there's a rich kinsman, part of your family. One guy named Abraham sent me to get a wife for his son. And all of a sudden, the camels that she watered is now hers. I'm telling you that if you, if you do it with the right heart and the right man, the right mind, maybe the right man too, when, when you do that, if you water your season now, what you're watering eventually will become for you. The woman was in Boaz. Boaz said, yo, leave it for her. Give her a little, drop a little extra. She was taking the, from the little crumbs of a field that would eventually be hers. If you are offended, to pick up something, then you're not ready to own that. You gotta be, I mean, you work, you work, you work in the bar. You gotta be able to clean that ground. You gotta be able to put out the garbage. You gotta be able to do that. If you're too prideful to do the hum humble humility part of life, God's not gonna take you too far. And this is the last tip I'm gonna give you this, because all of us here are leaders. Don't use your ambition to create frustration. Let me repeat that. Don't use your ambition to create frustration. You can't be too ambitious or so ambitious that you start cutting people's throat just to get ahead in life. <laughs> I could give it to Yes. Yeah, let me, let me read it again. Don't use your ambition to create frustration. Why are we frustrated? The Bible says contentment is good, you know. And contentment doesn't mean that I don't want more. I want more, but I'm so thankful. Oh, God, for what you're doing over here. God, I want more. But I'm, so, I'm just so thankful. And I'm going to work this little seed. I'm going to work this little family. I'm going to work this little job. I'm going to work this little city. I'm going to do this little educational journey. Oh, God, I want my doctor to give. But I'm so thankful. And it says, as you advance, because sometimes we're so ambitious, we create frustration. Because guess what? We have our eye on a different prize. We don't even realize that we finished a race. We finished that race. We didn't even stop to say, oh, wow, God, thank you. And it says, as you get ahead, you can't be so ambitious that you start cutting people's throat. He said, if I got cut your throat to go ahead, you keep your job there. You keep that friendship. You keep that A+. Plus. You keep that C. You keep that B. Because whatever God has for me, there you go. That's 
I hope this word ministers to you guys today. I know we, you know, we've heard, heard enough, but I also want to bless you. I want to thank God for you. I hope you go with it. I'll post it later, and I will write down what you said. Um, so let me just pray for you. Father, I just thank you for this family of God.